Hello and welcome to RTO Doctors 30 Days 30 Tips second series and today I have a special request for you in relation to meeting additional regulatory requirements. We're not sure who this request came through from, it came through on our feedback form and so I hope that you recognise uh, the topic that you selected and I will try and do it justice in as short a time as possible, bearing in mind that it's the end of the week, it's Friday, and while the 30 Days 30 Tips will still be going over the weekend, and we hope that you will join us, uh, we're all mindful that it is Friday evening in the Eastern States and just about Friday evening in the Western States, and so many people are heading off for the weekend. So, in relation to meeting additional regulatory requirements, what I would like to start off by saying is this is often an area where there is confusion. It's confusing for providers and it's also confusing for the trainers and assessors and it, it doesn't really need to be. So hopefully after today's topic we'll be able to shed some light on how to go about managing additional uh, re registration, licensing and, and regulatory requirements if they apply to your RTO because not all RTOs do have additional regulatory requirements. Um, but the first port of call in relation to meeting additional regulatory requirements I guess is making sure that you understand that they are completely separate. So it is an additional regulatory requirement, which means that primarily because you are an RTO issuing nationally recognised training uh, certification and the regulatory requirements are additional, you do need to meet the unit of competency or training package requirements first, meaning that you also have to meet ASQA's regulatory requirements or TAC or the VIQA, whoever you're registered with. So fundamentally, the the beginning or the starting point of meeting additional regulatory requirements is that you actually have to meet the ASQA, TAC or VRQA regulatory requirements first. Now that means meeting all of the standards for RTOs 2015 and, and all of the VET quality framework for that matter. So we would include in that the Australian qualifications framework and making sure that the volume of learning and um, all the outcomes for each certification level are, are also being met. Now, what are some of the types of additional registration, licensing or regulatory requirements that you might come across? Um, people would be surprised to know that it is more than just WorkSafe. Uh, there, there are a, a whole host of different regulatory environments out there and I'm not going to even pretend to, to cover them all off in today's 30 day 30 tip session. But just to give you a, an idea of, of some of the requirements and some of the acronyms, um, I, I've just jotted down a few here and I, I've actually got notes today and I apologise for this. The reason for the notes is because this is such a vast topic. I've really wanted to try and condense as much information as possible into the 30 days 30 tips for you so that you're getting all the information that you would need uh, just as an overview for the 30 days 30 tips and then I'm not leaving anything out. So just uh, going back to some of those uh, additional regulatory requirements or licensing registration requirements that might apply, uh, you have APRA, uh, you've got the AAMT, um, APRA of course being for health practitioners, uh, AAMT being for massage therapists, you've got CASA which is the Civil Aviation Safety Authority, uh, aviation security, you've got ANMAC for enrolled nursing courses, you've got Main Roads WA, Vic Roads in, in Victoria um, and equivalent traffic management uh, regulators in other jurisdictions throughout the country. You've obviously got WorkSafe in, in each of the jurisdictions but you've also got things like marriage celebrants and the Environmental Protection Agency Authority. Uh, EPA. 
you've also got the Victorian Building Authority in, in Victoria um, and equivalent bodies in, in other jurisdictions uh, where people have to go and get registered to become builders. Um, you've got VicPol, Victoria Police, the WA Police also for security qualifications, for example, the Department of Mines and Petroleum in, in WA and their equivalent in other jurisdictions. Something else that is not quite as well known but is also important when you consider additional regulatory requirements is the requirement to meet your local council regulatory requirements. Now this is important particularly in a delivery and, a delivery and assessment context because if you're delivering in a simulated environment for example and what would be required in your simulated environment for it to be reflective of the real workplace is running hot water, for example, um, then you would be required to make sure that you meet the requirement of hot water if that's what's required by your local council for a, a real workplace in that particular industry area. Um, you might have regulatory requirements as well in relation to building permits and uh, occupational health and safety and, and all of that sort of stuff as well. So some of these uh, training and assessment courses in particular will require approval prior to registration or in a, as part of an addition to scope, prior to um, seeking that addition to scope. And some will require that approval after. And, and some will actually require that you have a, a case manager that works with you as part of the application process. Now it's important to ensure also during this process of um, training and assessment um, development and how to manage your additional regulatory requirements that you're also ensuring that your clients are provided, with, all clients who are enrolled are provided with sufficient pre-enrolment information in relation to the registration or additional licensing regulatory requirements. For example, there, there may be um, additional criteria um, that are required as part of their licensing or, or registration, something that is outside your control. However, you need to provide them with that information pre-enrolment because if fundamentally they're enrolling in that course just so that they can register for that occupation, then it's incumbent on you to make sure that they are able to meet those registration requirements. Um, so for example, what I'm thinking of in particular here is if the course requires a driver's licence, um, the, the student should be advised about the requirement to have a driver's licence pre-enrolment. But what that also tells you is that there might also be an age restriction in relation to the entry requirement for the course. Um, if you need to get a working with children check as part of registration with the additional body or a police check and the pr prospective student has a, a criminal record, for example, it's going to impact their ability to be able to register for that particular job um, and to obtain registration with someone, um, for example, VicPol or, or the WA police as part of a security qualification or if they've got a, a history of sexual offences, they'll find it very difficult to to get registered with a CEQA or um, APRA or, or someone along those lines. Um, so it's really important that students know pre-enrolment um, whether or not they're going to be eligible for registration or licensing um, because that gives them an opportunity then to make an informed decision about whether or not they wish to enrol in the course. You should also ensure that you're only promoting nationally recognised training that does have an additional regulatory or licensing outcome um, if you've been endorsed as such or if the regulator, the additional regulator being CASA or ANMAC or AAMT or whoever the additional licensing body is or registration body is, you've got it confirmed from them as well that you are actually a, an approved provider. So the, there's no point in you trying to promote a course as being endorsed by ANMAC, for example, for the Diploma of Enrolled Nursing if you haven't actually got that 
approval from ANMAC because that would be false and misleading. It would be um, a, a breach of the standards for RTOs 2015. It would be a breach of um, Australian consumer law. It would be a, a breach of a whole range of different things. So um, another thing that you need to be mindful of is unless you control the outcome of registration or licensing with that particular body, and it's not likely that you will do that as a, a registered training organisation, you should not ever promote that by completing the course they will be eligible for or they will get registration from that particular body. There are often additional criteria that are outside your control as an RTO and you should never um, promote that if they complete this course, that's all that they will have to do to be eligible for registration. Often they have to provide other things like 100 points of identification, a clear police history, um, they, they might have to have a valid driver's licence or they might have to have a, a current valid white card or blue card or whatever it's called in your jurisdiction. Um, and if they don't hold those additional things, then they're not going to necessarily be able to get registration purely based on the completion of your course. So again, you need to be very careful about what you're promoting and how you're promoting it and the impact that that might have on the prospective student with regard to those additional regulatory and licensing registration requirements. Finally, one of the biggest issues that we see um, at RTO Doctor in relation to additional reg registration, licensing and registration requirements is around training and assessment. Um, it's something that not only do providers um, not necessarily understand, and when I say providers, I, I mean the, the governance of the RTO, the CEO and um, the principal executive officer primarily, but I'm also talking about the trainers and assessors. And there, there are many trainers and assessors out there who don't understand that you actually have to meet the unit of competency requirements first and the additional registration requirements second. So whether that be a work safe, high risk work assessment, for example, um, or whether it's the ANMAC standards for nursing or, or whether it's a, a security licensing issue, whatever the, the additional regulatory requirement is, it is secondary to the unit of competency and the training package requirement. Um, there are often gaps between the two, so between the, the licensing body's registration tools or um, if we take the, the high risk work licensing units, for example, from WorkSafe, there are often um, gaps between what is required by the mandated, the nationally mandated assessment instrument and the unit of competency that corresponds to that same licensing unit. So. What you actually need to do is to identify the gaps between both the unit of competency and the, the WorkSafe instrument or the ANMAC instrument, what, whatever, the, whatever the document is. But there will always or most likely be gaps and it's up to you to make sure that you've identified those gaps but also that you are addressing the unit of competency and training package first and subsequently and secondarily the assessment instrument from the regulator, um, the, the licensing body or, or whatever it might be. Um, so it's really important that you remember that your RTO registration comes first and then and only then does the um, additional registration requirement apply. Because don't forget, there are many courses where you can only deliver and assess those licensed and re um, additional registration requirements because you are a registered training organisation. So if you lose your ability to be an RTO because you haven't met the RTO requirements, then you're actually going to lose the opportunity to be a, a provider of that external licensing requirement anyway. So, for example, I, I'm thinking about the overseas bridging courses for nurses. That particular course actually requires you to hold RTO registration for you to even apply. Um, so if you lose your RTO registration, you won't be able to um, deliver the bridging program. Um, other than that, uh, I just wanted to bring to your attention that there 
is some information on the ASQA website in relation to additional um, regulatory requirements for licensing and accreditation and, and, and external registration. Um, they do have a, a spreadsheet there that provides some information, although it is not complete by any means for all jurisdictions across the country, and it certainly doesn't provide for all occupations. So it really is incumbent upon you as the provider with your subject matter experts to make sure that you are getting all of the information that you need in order to be able to deliver and assess any training that you are willing to or wanting to offer um, that may have a regulated outcome outside of ASQA, the VRQA or TAC. I hope that today's topic has been helpful for you. Uh, it's certainly food for thought over a long weekend. Um, I will be back sometime tomorrow uh, to deliver another 30 days, 30 tips, because while it's the weekend, I have made a commitment to delivering 30 days of 30 tips. So we will see you tomorrow and Sunday with new topics, and we hope that you'll be able to join us live. Uh, don't forget that if you have any topics that you would like us to talk about, please uh, give us that feedback on the three question survey. And also, if you've got a preferred time that you would like to see these 30 days, 30 tips, if you could also provide that feedback on the spreadsheet also. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow and have a wonderful weekend. Bye for now.